talk to Scott. Those fees don't include if we have to do the draws because that's oh, yeah. a separate holdback. I usually charge about. Well, we don't have Jesse yet, so. <laughs> has he been um, responding to the emails that he's coming? Yeah, he has. I don't know if I have his. So. so I'll give him another minute or two before I open up the regular um, class for everybody. When they join, they'll all be muted. Um, so we should be good. I think this is the right person. Let me see. Oh, shoot. I don't know who I just texted. Let me try somebody else. I just shot him an email. I don't know if I have his number. Since you're the first part of the program anyways, um, I'm going to open it up because it's almost 11. Um, And then maybe while you're talking, if he hasn't joined, I'll I'll see if I can dig up his phone number or something. And if he doesn't, I will um, try really hard to cover his part. We have some good data in there that um, I'm not familiar with, but his projects I am. Okay, so everybody's joining right now.
Hi, everyone. I know it's 11 right now. Uh, we'll give it another minute or so, and uh, then we'll get going. Can you guys hear me? How's it yep. going? Good. So everybody's uh, uh, in the room and uh, it's 11 o'clock. So why don't we get going, um, start this right on time and uh, uh, keep it prompt. I imagine there'll be uh, quite a few questions and stuff. So welcome everybody. Our class today is Small Homes and ADUs. I'm Steve McDonald. I'm the vice president and county manager of Deschutes County Title Company uh, going on almost 19 years now. Seems hard to believe. Uh, Deschutes County Title is your locally owned title and escrow company. We've got locations in Redmond, Bend, Lapine, and recently just added uh, Columbia County just outside of Portland. Uh, so they're going to be part of the Deschutes Title umbrella. Um, quick reminder, if you have questions, uh, throw them in the chat box. Uh, I'll try to get them and I will get them to our speakers. Uh, with that, we've got two great speakers today. We've got Pauline Hardy. She's a senior code planner with the city of Bend. And we've got Jesse Russell, the managing partner and CEO of Hiatus Homes. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to our speakers. Go ahead. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Steve. I am going to um, share my screen real fast. Um, I don't think you can see that, can you? Yes, we can. Oh, okay. One more, hold on. Okay. So uh, Jesse and I are here today to talk about um, some new code amendments that some went into effect in October of last year, and then a recently adopted amendment that will go into effect July 1st of this year, which is for Senate Bill 458. And then following the code amendments, Jesse's gonna provide some really good examples of what has been developed under these amendments, as well as some other projects that are kind of geared towards, I'd say, smaller homes. So House Bill 2001 was passed by the legislator and uh, dictated to the city what they um, are required to do. And with them being a population of 25,000, or greater, we were required to do quite a bit, um, essentially allow types of middle housing, which is duplexes, triplexes, quadplexes, and townhomes in all our resi residential zoning districts. And uh, there was limitations on what we could approve uh, for the uh, middle housing types. And we worked with a uh, stakeholder advisory committee, went through public hearing processes, and the amendments now uh, went into effect in November. And what they entail is basically for all middle housing now, there's no density maximums. So before, if you were to build like in our standard density residential district, which is the main zoning district in the city of Bend, let's say you wanna do a, a duplex or a triplex, you had a maximum density of 7.3 units to the acre. Now there's no density maximums. You just need to meet the minimum number of units per acre. All the lot sizes were reduced, and I'll go into a little bit more detail about these in the next couple slides. The parking requirements for all the middle housing was either eliminated or reduced. The floor area ratio, which is the massing of a building on a property, was um, significantly revised. And if you were familiar with any of your um, clients' projects for residential compatibility standards, those were completely deleted. And I'm not going to go into detail about those, but it was a very old code um, section that basically per, protected, I guess, larger properties. And um, with the idea of needing more housing, that amendment was uh, removed. All the height for the zones increased by five feet. And then there's new design standards um, for the middle housing. And we also revised accessory dwelling units. Um, and I'll go into detail about that. And we created a whole new section called cottage cluster developments with these um, House Bill 2001 amendments. So the lot size is now for a um, 
duplex has been reduced to um, like in our standard density residential district, it is now 4,000 square feet. And in our medium um, district, it's 2,500 square feet. And in the high density, it's only 1,250 um, square feet for the lot for a duplex. And as you go down, you can see what a triplex has been reduced to. And even a fourplex now, you can build in the standard density residential district on a 4,000 square foot lot. And then townhouses used to be based on lot size specific. Now it's an average lot size if you wanna build townhouses. So in our um, low density, standard density, and medium density districts, the average lot size is 1,500 square feet. And then in the high density residential district, it's reduced, the average now is 1,200 square feet. So floor area ratio, um, without going into too much detail, we used to have a floor area ratio, which is again, the massing of a building on a property um, of 0.6%. And it wasn't real restrictive, but um, it, it didn't fall within the parameters of House Bill 2001. So what we did have for duplexes and triplexes, accessory dwelling units and dwelling units on flag lots was a 0.6 floor area ratio. And then single family dwelling units in some cases were also, also subject to this floor area ratio. After working with the committee and then going through the Planning Commission and City Council hearings, the final um, adoptive floor area ratio now only applies to structures that are um, in the standard density residential district and if they're three stories. Um, if you're in the other districts, there is no floor area ratio. The um, height increases, the City Council um, bumped them up by five feet in each district. So in our low standard and RM10 districts, what used to be 30 feet maximum height is now 35. And in the medium density went from 35 to 40. And then the residential high district now is up to 50 feet in height. And the reason being was we are seeing um, a lot of flat roofed developments and by adding an extra five feet um, helps give a little bit more flexibility towards architecture. So if they want to slope roof, they can now. And in some cases, they might even be able to add an extra story. The parking requirements um, were uh, either, like I said, eliminated or significantly reduced. And just because there is no parking requirements for some of the uses doesn't mean a developer can't put in as much parking as they wanted. So for example, a duplex and a triplex, the previous code based the parking on the number of bedrooms. So if it was a one bedroom, we used to require one parking space per unit. And if it was a two plus bedroom, it was two spaces per unit. And with the adopted code, there's no minimum requirements, but a developer can put in parking if they choose to do so. And then a quadplex, um, as you can see, there was previous parking requirements based on the number of bedrooms, similar to our duplex and triplex. But what was adopted now is in the standard, medium, and high density residential districts, it's one per development is the minimum, not one per unit, but one per development. And then in the low density residential district, it is two per development. And then townhouses used to be two parking spaces per dwelling unit is now one parking space per dwelling unit. Cottage clusters um, is very similar to what you've been seeing developed here in Bend. Um, the cottage cluster here on the right was developed under the Northwest Crossings um, Development Code. So they have their own standards. And then the City of Bend already has a cottage um, development code, which Jesse will show you an example of his hiatus project that was built under that specific code. Well, with House Bill 2001, they actually um, created some specific standards that didn't quite fit very well with what we already allow. So we created a new section. So we kept our original cottage development um, requirements, and then we created a new cottage cluster um, development requirement. So a developer now has two options, depending on which one works best for them. And the main difference between the two cottage clusters uh, type developments is the footprint. For some reason, um, House Bill 2001 specified that a cottage building footprint um, can be 900 square feet maximum with an allowance for up to 200 square feet towards a garage. 
But what this really means is that the picture on the right, you cannot build under the new cottage cluster house bill 2001 development because some of those single stories in that picture are larger than 900 square feet. So we wanted to keep in our code the option to have single story cottages that are greater than 900 square feet. So again, we kept our original cottage development chapter and created this new cottage cluster chapter. Um, all of them are allowed in our residential districts in the low standard and medium density residential districts. These are not allowed in our high density residential districts because um, high density residential doesn't allow single family detached homes, which is basically what a cottage is. Um, and a cottage cluster, as you can see in the picture, um, is basically cottages that are required to be around open space. Um, 12, 12 maximum can be around a, a large open space, as you see in the picture. And there is no lot coverage or floor ratio. It's pretty flexible. And there's not even setback requirements except for the parent site, which is the original site that is being developed. So you still have to meet the side, front and rear setbacks for the parent site. Uh, with the cottage clusters, there is no minimum parking requirements. The other type of cottage development, there is a parking requirement. And all of them require uh, the cottages or a portion of them anyways to front onto the open space or to have access to the open space through like a sidewalk. Um, and then accessory dwelling units. I started working here in 2015 and we keep amending this section to provide more flexibility. It's definitely um, a popular option for people to be adding onto their dwelling units is uh, this accessory dwelling unit. And every year we see, we track these and we are getting more and more. Um, we're up to over a hundred a year now, which is uh, pretty significant compared to some other cities. So you can build an accessory dwelling unit with a detached single family dwelling, a town home or a manufactured home. And only one accessory dwelling unit is allowed per lot. What changed is with the, the package of amendments in November is allowing all accessory dwelling units to be up to 800 square feet. Prior to these amendments, it was based on the lot square footage. And I believe if your lot was 6,000 square feet or less, then you were limited to oh, only um, 600 square feet. But now, since we allow duplexes in all our residential zones, a house in an ADU really is just like a duplex in, in the sense and so um, duplexes don't have a maximum square footage. So the city council adopted an increase for all lots now to be um, allow their accessory dwelling unit to be 800 square feet. With House Bill 2001, we are not allowed to require parking for an accessory dwelling unit. So that was deleted. Um, but again, if a, a developer or a homeowner wants to provide parking, they definitely can. And if you're going to build an accessory dwelling unit, but you don't want it attached to your house, the main requirement is that they have to be six feet apart from each other. And this is the same distance requirement for a middle housing. The duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes, they don't have to be attached. They can actually be detached as long as there's six feet between each of the um, building footprints. This has been in the code for a while, and we did make some amendments with the package. So it's called shared court. And we haven't had any built yet, but we have quite a few um, all of a sudden now going through the land division process. So a shared court development is where it's, um, it's allowed in our medium and high density residential districts, and it permits townhomes within the development and townhomes and accessory dwelling units. If they want to do both, they can. The idea behind this is that the units front the street but then you can have units in the back and you don't need to put in a full street to access those units. You can put in a private access drive with very narrow width or minimum width, I should say of 24 feet. But this doesn't require the developer again to put in a full street and curbs, gutter, sidewalk, everything to provide frontages to the townhomes in the back. You can just use the private access drive. But any of the units that do front a public street, except for arterials, they do have to provide a front door and um, the front of a dwelling unit so that you don't see the backs of the dwelling units. The um, units that are internal to the site too have much more um, flexibility when it comes to their setbacks. Their garages can be you know, almost five feet back of the private access drive or 20 feet. So 
it provides definitely some different um, setbacks and um, definitely some flexibility when the uh, developers interested in doing shared courts. And I believe we have three land divisions in right now for this type of development. Small dwelling unit developments, and Jesse's gonna provide an example of these, I think, um, is relatively new and quite popular. So what this does is allows a developer to create smaller lots than are normally permitted. So in our standard density residential district, normally you are required to do a 4,000 square foot lot for a single family um, home. In this case, you can go down to 1,500 square feet. But the caveat is that you are restricted in your floor area. So you can have a small lot, but um, you have to develop a small home too. So these only allow single family detached dwellings, accessory dwelling units, and duplexes. They are only allowed in the standard and medium density residential districts. The minimum lot size, as I mentioned, is 1,500 square feet. So the restrictive floor area is, um, if you're going to do a house and an ADU, the primary dwelling unit cannot exceed 800 square feet. And then the, um, the ADU must not exceed 600 square feet, except that the total square footage on the site cannot exceed 1200 square feet. Again, we're trying to keep the, the units smaller because they're on a smaller lot. So a developer would have an option of like an 800 square foot single family home and a 400 square foot ADU um, for a total of 12, or they could do two 600 square foot units, again, for a total of 1200 square feet. And there is some square footage allowance for uh, garages if the developer wants to propose a um, garage for one or both of the units. You can also just do a single family home at a maximum of 800 square feet if you don't wanna do an accessory dwelling unit. And the density is calculated much differently too because these are smaller units. So um, if the dwelling units are going to be 600 square feet or smaller, it's only counted as a quarter of a dwelling unit when you're looking at the maximum density. And then if you rank, if your if your units um, are between 601 and 800 square feet, then they count as a half a dwelling unit. And we do have quite a few of these going through the permitting process right now. And it definitely meets a need that the city is looking for for um, providing smaller homes on smaller lots. This um, is an example of a picture of what a small dwelling unit could look like. Um, thank you, Jesse, for the picture. And the, the lot width, again, is only 1,500 square feet. Uh, so the lot width is significantly reduced from, I think our standard density residential is 40 feet normally. So the lot width on these is 20 feet. And we haven't seen, I don't think any applicants applications actually go as small as 20 feet. I think most of them are 25 feet or greater. And then they do have reduced side yard setbacks um, of three feet, which is typically uh, five feet and reduced rear setbacks if they're under 25 feet, um, again, down to three feet. And there's some exceptions for eaves so we can get some articulation of the architecture given that they have um, smaller lots. There is a uh, design standards to help reduce the prominence of garages. Um, that a lot of times in planning, we wanna make sure we're planning for the people and the livability of the structures and not just for the cars. So we try to reduce the prominence of the garage and bring the front door and the livable space forward if possible. And the re parking requirements are reduced as well. Again, remember with House Bill 2001, we cannot require parking for ADUs. So this, the primary dwelling unit would require one parking space and an ADU would not require any parking space. And I, yeah, that, uh, yep. Yeah. And then this one is a zero lot line development. Um, lots of cities have this. Our code just didn't have it, so we added it. Um, we don't really get a lot of requests for this type of development, but if someone's interested, it does provide um, the flexibility of allowing the units in a zero lot line development to actually have one wall on the property line. And if a developer chooses to do something like this, then there is some restrictions or it, additional setbacks on the side and easements. So that um, one easement would allow the, the owner of the home on the property line to be able to access and maintain that sidewall of their unit. And then the setbacks are increased because the idea behind this is that instead of having a large backyard, 
you would have a larger um, side yard for usable space. And on these walls, because they are built on the property line, uh, windows and doors are not permitted there. And there is, like I said, some easements along the side for um, maintenance and also drainage easements. Micro unit developments, uh, which is exciting because I believe Jesse is in the process of um, constructing our first one. Micro unit developments um, provide a different type of uh, dwelling unit, similar to apartments, but definitely a little bit different, and they are restricted in size of the units. So these are allowed only in our medium and high density residential districts and in our mixed use and mixed neighborhood districts, as well as the Bend Central District. A micro unit development typically consists of one living room space designed with seating, a bedroom, a bathroom, and food preparation area. So similar to an apartment, except that they are limited in size to 400 square feet. They are not allowed to have a kitchen, but they are allowed to have a food prep area, which means by code, they have to provide a certain amount of counter space, um, a sink, and um, a, a refrigerator, as well as a, uh, I believe it's a 200, 220 outlet. So if someone wants to plug in a microwave or a um, uh, toaster oven or some, something like that, they can. So it, it basically is allowing a wet bar in um, the micro unit. And then in addition to each unit having a food prep area, as well as its own private bathroom is required, a common kitchen is also required as well as laundry facilities. So that if someone, let's say, was renting one of these and they wanted to bake a bigger meal or have company over, they might want to use the common kitchen or they can just use their um, food preparation area in their own unit. And there is private and common open space requirements for each of these and reduced parking because they are so small um, in square footage. So this is an example of a larger micro unit development in Portland. And this is just one of the floors. But as you can see, each one has a little food prep area in their um, uh, micro unit. And then in addition, they have a shared kitchen on each floor, as well as bicycle storage as an amenity. Um, and then each of them have either a balcony or there's some um, other open space that they can share. And then the picture actually here is a smaller scale micro unit development that you might see like in the medium density residential neighborhoods where it looks and acts like a house. But each of these um, units here are the micro units. And then the one in the middle is actually the shared living room and kitchen area. So Senate Bill 458 is my last one before Jesse will um, start. And this just passed uh, by the city council on July 1st and it goes in, or I'm sorry, June 1st, and it goes into effect July 1st. This is also required by state law along with House Bill 2001 amendments. So House Bill 2001 amendments that we just went over provide more opportunities for rental units in the city of Bend. Again, allowing all those middle housing types and all the residential districts with more flexibility. Senate Bill 458 takes House Bill 2001 a little bit further and creates opportunities for home ownership. And what it does is it requires a city to allow the middle housing to be um, subdivided or partitioned so that each of the middle housing units resides on its own lot. So as you can see in the picture on the right, the city will be reviewing this triplex because it's three units through, to make sure that the triplex meets the, the codes you know, that we look at for a triplex. So we're looking at height, setbacks, lot coverage, parking, um, all those requirements. And then Senate Bill 58 will allow them to come in through an expedited land division process and create property lines through the triplex. So in this case, the triplex is attached, but they don't have to be. So that lot three now will reside on its own lot, lot one on its own lot, and lot two on its own lot. So you can sell off all three of these lots and provide an opportunity for ownership. And if there is, like in this case, the parking in the back, when we review this middle housing type, then the city is allowed to require these easements so that people can actually access the parking if it's on another property. It, Senate Bill 458 was quite restrictive on what the city can and can't allow. So what the, the code 
um, essentially that was adopted is in compliance with Senate Bill 458. So it will apply to duplexes, triplexes, and quadplexes. This does not apply to accessory dwelling units. And it has to result, um, if someone were to uh, apply for an expedited land division, one dwelling unit per lot. So you can't come in later on and then add an accessory dwelling unit. It is only allowed to have one dwelling unit per lot. The code will require separate utilities for each of the dwelling units. So water and sewer um, will be separate for each dwelling unit. Unlike a triplex would only have one service. If you take it a step further and you go through land division, then each has to have its own services. The city is allowed and did include in the amendments um, uh, easements for pedestrian access, common areas, driveways and parking areas and utilities. So if any of these cross over your neighbor's property, um, then we, the city will require easements for those. One of the requirements that will be um, uh, upon the applicant to submit with their application for an expedited land division is compliance with the building code. So when they submit, we wanna see from a architect how the units, once there's new property lines through them, how they comply with the building codes, including the Oregon Residential Specialty Code, because there's no setback requirements between the new property lines. And so if you're two or three feet off those property lines, we need to see how you um, are making that, that, that particular dwelling unit in compliance with these codes. And more importantly, if the units are attached, how they are constructed um, to meet these codes once the property lines go through each unit. The city is able to require street frontage um, improvements. So if there is no curb gutter sidewalk, uh, the city can require that on the parent site. And if there wasn't enough right of way um, as part of the land division, then the city can ask for right of way. If someone is interested in submitting for a expedited land division, the review time is um, significantly review, reduced. So it's called expedited for a reason. Typical land divisions are 120 day review time. And in this case, it is 63 days. So almost cut in half. If someone does wanna submit one of these, they can do it if there's existing middle housing already on the lot and they wanna come in and then par partition it or do a land division uh, to put them on their individual lots. There might be some retrofitting needed for those existing units if they don't meet the residential specialty code or the building codes. Uh, when it comes to the new property lines, uh, but it is possible. Another option is if someone's already applied for middle housing prior to this bill going into effect or after, and then they haven't built it yet or it's under construction, and then they decide they want to go through this process, they can. And then the other option is if it's just a blank slate, they need to submit concurrently. So they'll need to submit their middle housing land, um, middle housing application so we can see what they're proposing. Um, and that also includes a letter from the architect saying how those future units will meet the um, Oregon Residential Specialty Code. So they can submit the building permit and the expedited land division at the same time. And then with occupancy, off the top of my head, when they wanna do the final plat with one of these land divisions, they, um, the final plat won't be approved until the framing inspections are done. So we want to see the units under construction before we um, approve the final plat. And then a, typically a developer will then go record the final plat, then they can get occupancy, but no occupancy will be issued until the, um, the final plat is recorded. What Senate Bill 58 does not allow the city to do is require street frontage. So we can require frontage improvements, but we cannot require that each of these units front the street. So you will have landlocked parcels. So in that picture that I showed you, there was a parcel in the back that has absolutely no street frontage. Maybe they're gonna front the alley or maybe there's no alley and they are just in the back of the lot. Um, we cannot require any additional parking for these or driveway accesses to each lot. Unless, I mean, if there's already parking on site, then obviously there'll be a driveway to access that parking and we can require easements for that, but that is it. There is no minimum lot size or dimensions that we can require. Again, we're just looking at it as, let's say the triplex example. We are looking at the triplex as a middle housing application and the parent site, um, the 
parent site needs to meet the minimum lot size and the setbacks and the, you know everything that goes along with the parent site. But once they come in and they propose new lots, we can't say uh, anything about the lot size or dimensions of those lots. So again, with the fourth bullet, it's very restrictive on what we can and cannot review. And what we can review again is that each one has separate utilities, um, that there's easements that might be required, that there's only one unit on each lot and building code compliance. And then, um, so that's it for my presentation. And now Jesse's gonna show you some great examples of work he's been doing in the city event. Thanks, Pauline. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, and I, I will say with the um, with all the stuff I'm going to show you here, without the the help from the city, uh, Pauline, and everybody else that um, gets these codes to be pushed through, we wouldn't be able to do any of these projects. So um, it's been really great to uh, see all the progress we've made in the last few years on these smaller uh, dwelling units. Um, so yeah, this is a Hiatus Homes. That's my company. Um, we're, we kind of started. We started as a uh, as a tiny house on wheels builder um, here in Bend. I built our first house uh, five or six years six years ago, I think. Um, and it was a it was a tiny house on wheels. And I wanted to put four of them on a lot, um, and that was not possible because of uh, because of the way the code was at the time. Um, and so we kind of started down this path. Uh, and what we realized really quickly was that there was a lot of people out there that wanted to live in these smaller houses. Um, and if that's the case, you know, the question that kind of comes up um, is why aren't there more, uh, more of these kind of dwelling types, these uh, micro apartments or, you know, uh, studios or cottages. Um, so, you know, after, uh, after the war, after, you know, World War II, uh, there was the suburbs were born, you know, and most of the people that were living in houses uh, were four people. There were two, you know, two parents and two kids, um, and that lasted for a long time as far as the demographics went. Until 1970, uh, most households were still made up of of families. Um, so that's changed a lot. Um, this is uh, this is from the, these stats are from the Smithsonian um, exhibit that happened uh, pretty recently on small housing. Um, now we have a real mix of of housing types. Um, you know, 28% of housing types are just a single person living alone that doesn't have a partner. 25% uh, are couples. Um, adults sh sharing with other adults is 20%, and then, you know, single parent families. So you're seeing that this huge 80% uh, of people don't necessarily need what has been traditionally built, these uh, larger three bedroom, two baths, um, and that uh, that larger family has been reduced uh, by 50%. Um, so with that in mind, uh, you know, if this is what the market is needing, you know, why are we not seeing seeing uh, more of this? Well, a part of that is this outdated zoning policy um, and what the city has really worked hard at. And um, you're starting to see this with the state of Oregon. You're starting to see this nationally as well, is to look at these zoning policies uh, that would only allow, for instance, as Pauline was saying, in a residential standard lot, uh, a 4,000 square foot lot. Well, our houses, um, our smaller cottages, the footprint on those cottages is 18 feet by 20 feet. Um, and you can easily fit, uh, fit four of those on a, a residential lot, but we weren't allowed to do that because you were only allowed to have one dwelling per lot. So those outdated zoning policies have, have been part of, part of the problem. Uh, there's also a building code, how the, 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 the building itself is built. Um, one of the real innovations that came from the tiny house on wheels um, uh, movement is these different types of, uh, of ways to use that space. Um, and one of the really, really big innovations is the, is the lofted bedroom. Now to get to that bedroom, sometimes you need to use a ladder, you need to use a staircase to get there that's much uh, different than what building code was allowing. So um, nowadays we have the code supports that and we're able to build those buildings. Um, and then you know, these larger builders uh, are slow to change. And it's it's been a seller's market until uh, until maybe a month ago. I mean, we might see that changing now, but um, they were building uh, what they were building and they were selling it. So why would they change? Um, and so that's that's why we haven't seen, um, seen a change until now, I believe. Uh, so then we came along, uh, we were Heidis Homes. This is a photo of our our very first um, cottage that we built in 2015, uh, the city of Bend adopted the cottage code. Um, and that kind of happened in unison with us trying to figure out how we were gonna uh, build several houses um, on a lot. 
Um, and so this land came up, it's about three acres, um, and uh, we built our first home. Uh, so the first, the first one is these cottages. Um, so they're right around 600 square feet, a little bit under that. Um, and the way we utilize space, we have a bike box on the front of the, um, on the front of the deck there. Um, and these are also really energy efficient. Um, we are able to, we now have some uh, net zero homes that I'll show you. Um, even these houses at the time were 50% uh, better. They performed 50% better than an, uh, a, a house built to the current building code. Now, Oregon's building code has gotten a lot better as far as that goes. Um, even so we've had, had to say, now we can't say 50% anymore. We can say maybe about 30%. Um, because the, the requirements of the code has gotten better. Um, but the real reason we're able to do that, um, we do upgrade the windows and we upgrade the insulation, um, but that's about as fancy as we get with that. Our houses are so small that conditioning the space is pretty easy. So we're able to get to a net, net zero or a net zero ready uh, house pretty easily. And then you see the storage stairs there that have some shelves and stuff, and that leads up to the, uh, to the lofted bedroom. Um, this is our, our kind of second model. Um, this is a two bedroom, two bath. Um, you know, we were hearing from people that weren't just single people living in a cottage uh, that they wanted a little bit more space. So um, this is our two bedroom, two bath. It's still, it's still really small. Um, the, the, average, uh, the average house in America is about 2,600 square feet. That statistic is old. Hopefully that's changed actually, but um, that's what it was about a year ago. Um, and so this is our two bedroom, two bath, 900 square feet, a livable space with about a 300 square foot uh, garage. Um, that garage is fully finished um, and can operate as a flex space if needed. Um, these have really beautiful vaulted ceilings, uh, a combined kitchen living room with a, um, with a big uh, um, a big panoramic door that opens up to a really nice view of the cascades there. Um, these, there were 10 of these and they were all net zero. So that was, that was exciting to get that project done. Which I think we'll see more of it here in a minute. Um, yeah, and then as Pauline said, uh, it was really exciting to be part of the um, the 2001 uh, stakeholder group um, that Pauline put together. Um, that was basically a group of of, um, of professionals, uh, architects, builders, developers, um, city. Uh, some I think we had a city councilor in there, maybe. Um, yeah, and anyways, we're just a really great group. And uh, what's been really neat and and really fortunate was to come home to my hometown and it just happens to be a city that's really on the cutting edge of, of this building code and really supports trying to uh, innovate. So um, we weren't required to, to have micro apartment code by House Bill 2001, but everybody on the committee agreed that that was a good thing to do as well as a small unit development code. Um, and so that got adopted. So we're in the middle of building this building. It's over by the Yacht Club uh, in Midtown. A lot of support from the, the Midtown community. Um, that was one of the first public meetings I've been a part of where uh, we had a lot of support from the, the neighbors, which was nice. Um, this is a three bedroom, or sorry, three story, uh, 40 unit um, apartment building. Um, and as Pauline started to describe a little bit about that code, what really makes this different, um, or there's several things that make it different, um, but one of those is that uh, you have like a kitchenette inside of each of these apartments, and then uh, in the center of each of these floors, we have a big, uh, we have a big shared kitchen that's also, we look at it as a co-working space. Um, so we see this as a really good uh, spot for someone who's a remote worker. Uh, they can come in and uh, live in their apartment and then uh, share uh, the community space that's on each of the floors. There's also a rooftop deck up there with a fire pit and some hammocks and some barbecues. Um, so we're really excited about this project. Um, as it was with doing the first cottage uh, thing, I know there's going to be some bumps along the way, but um, overall, everyone's been really supportive. Uh, we're just waiting for our construction uh, permit to come back. Um, we plan on starting to build this in uh, uh, October, November. Uh, it's about a year and a half to build. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's the micro apartment. So we're excited about that one. Um, and then we can just go through the projects. I kind of described the units that we had in them. This was our first, um, the first uh, cottage development that I was describing in 2015. So this was 22 cottages. It was about three and a half acres. We had to put in a, a city road as well as a couple of private roads um, that, that kind of it's a U shape that loops around. Um, and you, you know, the really cool thing about this I think one of the cool things about the cottage code is not requiring uh, the cottages to front the streets. 
Um, and it, uh, architect in Portland, Ross Chapin, um, had, has kind of really uh, defined this idea and it's part of how we adopted the code. Um, and that's the idea of these cottages being in clusters. So kind of flipping the idea of, of your house facing a street, the idea is that the house faces these common areas um, and then puts the, the street and the parking behind you. So you walk into your house through your back door um, and come out onto the deck and then you'll be facing, uh, in this development, we have uh, two, um, two community gardens. There's a pond, there's some beautiful uh, paths and some real mature ponderosas that go through there. So it's a really, it's just a really nice feeling to, to, to live in that development. Um, it was financially really successful. Uh, which uh, led to us starting a, a construction fund that we now fund all our projects with. Um, and uh, so that was that was a happy bonus to this. Um, so yeah, average sale price is 274. Uh, we started the first house was 230. The la I've heard that there's houses in there reselling now for um, over 400,000, which is staggering to think about. But sounds like those prices might come down in the next next few months um yeah so that was uh hiatus benham um that's some photos of it you can kind of see the lofted uh the lofted bedroom up there um and then if you flip around that's the kitchen with the island in the living room and above the kitchen cabinets you can see there's another small storage space with a ladder that goes up there to uh to, for some extra storage um there's the community garden down there uh that's in the center of the cluster um, Hyatt's Roanoke, this is made up of our two bedrooms. Um, this is 10 houses. It's over on 9th Street on the west side. Um, and these are, they all face south. So we had some really nice passive solar, uh, solar components to these houses. And then um, all of them are net zero, net zero ready, meaning that um, we work with Energy Trust of Oregon to do blower door tests and certify these homes. If the homeowner decides to add solar, then the average uh, the average solar or the average uh, user will um, will have all the energy they need from the solar. Um, we had five of the 10 houses have solar on them, but they're all ready for solar. Um, yeah, and those were 10, 10 houses on uh, 0.6 acres. And that just shows kind of what was there before. That was a small small house, it had a garage, and then there was like kind of a little shed there. So just kind of showing the density that we can get um, um, with some of these smaller units uh, as we start to look around Ben. Uh, ben has, you know, uh, all these RS lots are really large and there's the finished, uh, the finished development. Um, this, is Hiatus Rose, uh, this is Hiatus Roosevelt. This is, we just started framing the, the first house in this. Um, this house, now we took that two bedroom, we uh, turned the garage into a bedroom. So now we have a three bedroom house uh, with an ADU in the back and the ADU is above a garage. Um, so a lot of flexibility for the homeowner to uh, live in one, rent the other out, rent both out, um, that sort of thing. So um, yeah, in the middle of building that right now, it's over, we should be, have the model home done in about four or five months. Um, hiatus pen we talked about, this is under the micro uh, apartment code. Um, I kind of ran you through that, so. I don't know much more to say there. That's the that's the interior of one of the units. That's the bedroom that overlooks it. Um, and then this is Hiatus Ninth. This is a cool one to talk about um, because of the um, uh, we're using the small unit development code. So this wouldn't have been possible, um, you know, a, a while ago because uh, of the the size of the lots. So you can see on, below there. That's the site map. Um, there's nine lots. It's on about a half acre. There was just one house there when we started this, um, one existing old dilapidated house that uh, we took down. Um, there's nine lots there. That was our original plan there. You can see that we had two detached cottages. Um, those lots were pretty small and it made a lot more sense to actually squish the cottages together. So thus our, our, new, uh, our new model came out. This is a um, an attached ADU. So it's a, you can see that it's a butterfly roof. Imagine the alley that's in the back of the site there. Um, you come in through the garage, uh, walk into the front of the house on the first story, and that's where your kitchen living room is. Walk up the interior stairs and your bedroom is, is up there. Um, and then uh, above the garage is a detached or an attached unit, which is very similar to a cottage. So you have two, two rentable units for live in one and rent out the other. 
Um, we're in land use uh, right now on this and um, hopefully start our construction uh, in, in the summer here uh, soon. That's just another floor plan to show you um, how that, that little twin house works. Um, yeah. And that's the original one. So, so yeah, that's, um, that's us. We've got another, we're um, in escrow on some land over by our original development um, that would be a combination of our two bedrooms and our cottages, um, about 40 units. Um, and that would use our, our new cottage, uh, cottage cluster code. Um, yeah, and it's just interesting to see those two developments. So the first one that we did in 2015 is, uh, is literally one block over from this new property that we're looking at. Um, and some things to just uh, highlight there um, would be the density. First of all, you know, in that first development, uh, it was seven, uh, seven houses per acre. Now we're able to get the smaller units, uh, 20 houses, uh, 28 houses per acre. Um, which uh, we probably would never do that many, but it, uh, nice to have the flexibility for that density. Um, and then to look at the land costs, um, you know, the land costs on that first development, uh, if you can believe it, were 350,000. Uh, the land costs on our other three acres that we're doing right now, uh, 1.8 million. Um, so, uh, you know, pretty, pretty crazy. But um, also one of the things that's happened with the city uh, is the system development charges have scaled with the density um, for these smaller units. Um, so our SDCs that were thirty thousand dollars in the first development will will now for be for those same units somewhere around eight thousand um, dollars. Although they're going up in July, so somewhere around there. But yeah, uh, that's a that's a great savings that keeps us going because land is going up, but we're we're saving some money on SDCs. So, um, but yeah, it's just been great to to um, see all this innovation and in, in Bend and and be able to supply some some housing. So thank you, everybody. Awesome, Jesse, Pauline, thank you uh, so much. Everybody, we got time for some questions and uh, we've got one in here already uh, from Dan Evans. Uh, his question is to you, Jesse. He says, your designs and build quality are really nice. My concerns are what other builders and developers may choose to do under the new code, given that specific finish quality, quality isn't codified. Your thoughts? Um, yeah, I have a lot of thoughts on that. Um, we, we, our quality has been high and it's kept our prices of our houses really high. And what it's really done is made resale of those houses really high. So, um, you know, our original plan or my original plan was, you know, I grew up here. My mom was a bartender here. We were able to afford a house. Um, and when I got back here, that just wasn't the case. So it felt like, okay, well, we'll build these really small houses and just by design, they'll be affordable. Um, and it's, that hasn't been the case. I mean, these are, these things are a thousand dollars a square foot. So, um, I understand your concern of other builders coming in and what I would call is value engineering. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot that could be saved in these houses, uh, not doing quartz countertops, not doing mowing fixtures, not doing cedar siding, um, that I think will, will lead to, a, I would hope a, a house that's a little bit cheaper. We're working with uh, core land trust right now to do a seven, uh, cottage, uh, development over on Poplar, um, and that we are trying to value engineer. But I think there are some decisions you can make in value engineering that are still aesthetically pleasing. But yeah, we don't have any control of what people are going to build, um, and we don't have any, any control over uh, what one person thinks is nice and what another person thinks is nice. So um, those are my thoughts. Uh, and and yeah, there's no way that I know of, and Pauline could probably speak to this, for us to control. Uh, yeah, that part of the design and build. All right, thanks, Jesse. Um, Dan, great question. Uh, I don't see any other questions in there, so I'm going to ask you, you know, one or two if that's all right. Um, our audience today is uh, about 80 real estate agents, and I'm kind of curious, you know, for either of you, um, if there's anything that um, on this topic that you would advise them to be talking to their buyers and sellers about. Um, ADUs, uh, the coding that's coming up. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it to both of you and just what, what do you think they should be uh, talking to their clients about? For, um, from the code perspective, I think two things. One, um, obviously that, you know, there's a lot of flexibility now to build the duplexes, triplexes, and quads um, in all neighborhoods. And so you can get a number of units now on a piece of property and then the take it a step further is that each of those units can be on their own lot. And we've, like I said, we've had so many, um, what we call pre-apps 
um, we've been looking at projects already of, of interest of people who have a house and they wanted to add a duplex, but then now we let them know, well, that unit can actually be on its own lot. And that really gives some momentum because now they can sell off that own lot instead of it being a rental if they choose to do that. And then the ADUs, um, like I said, we just keep seeing more and more get developed. And with the flexibility of allowing them up to 800 square feet and no parking requirements, I mean, it's definitely an option um, for homeowners to consider. And I would say too, with all the middle housing and accessory dwelling units that we've been seeing, even though there's no parking requirements for most of those, we are seeing um, uh, homeowners or developers putting in the parking that they feel is needed to either be able to rent the units or sell the units. Um, I, yeah, I would say just uh, on a practical sense, sometimes with the smaller cottages, people ask if they're, uh, if they're, if the mortgages or the insurance is different than a than a regular house and uh it is not it's it's just it's uh fee simple on its own lot um and so it's it's sold just like uh, a normal house would would be um and then i think the other thing i would just say is you know as as pauline's saying there's so much flexibility in the code now um i think it's i think it's good for people that are trying to sell um maybe sell property or houses uh, to do a little bit of research and, and see what is available on their lot or their, or their land or their, their house that they're trying to, to sell. And I see this now sometimes in, in uh, ads that say, oh yeah, you can do a micro apartment here. You can do this or that here. Um, I think being able to educate your, your sellers on what, uh, what they have is probably going to be helpful for the seller and then the buyers too, you know, just getting to know these codes and stuff. Um, Cause I think you're going to see more and more builders and developers using these codes and asking, Hey, can I do this on the land you're trying to sell me or not? And so, um, you know, yeah, just kind of educating yourself, I think is really good. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. We've got a couple of questions coming in. Um, as the city, this is from Steve Wells, as the city is keen on encouraging the smaller units, are the S are there SDC permit reductions to help promote their development? Um, yeah, Steve, I, I had mentioned that earlier. Um, and basically what it is, is there was a density uh, at one point, um, these smaller units, zero to 600 square feet and 601 square feet to 1200 square feet, um, they started to get this density calculation that was helpful. So instead of the seven per acre, uh, if you had a 600 square foot house, you it was considered 0.25 of a house so you got four times the density um that you would for a for a standard size house so that got applied to the sdcs as well um so for instance on the micro apartments um there's 40 units there that would have been thirty thousand dollars per unit uh traditionally um that's been scaled to and i haven't gotten an official sdc estimate but um somewhere around a quarter of that so almost a million dollar savings um on the micro apartment um, and that's the case with the small unit development code um, as well. Uh, I think any, and Pauline can speak to this, but any of the, um, any of the small, smaller stuff, if you have that density, if you have that density uh, uh, incentive, you also get the SDC uh, uh, scaling. Honestly, I'm not really familiar with our SDCs. I believe they just got updated, Jesse, and you helped them with it, but what the reductions are, um... I would encourage you to call the city and ask because I, know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know some of it, but yeah, as, as Pauline's saying, um, you can get an SEC estimate uh, for anything that you're proposing, but roughly, um, roughly zero to 600 square feet is a quarter of that $30,000 and roughly 600 to 1200 square feet is half of that. So it's a big deal when you're, when you're uh, looking at building a house. Great. Thank you. Uh, Victoria Tolanen has uh, just a comment. The city is keen on encouraging people to live in small units with no parking and very small lots, but my clients are increasingly more frustrated with the lack of normal, practical, livable homes. So it's just a so comment. I, do, I don't know if you want to comment on that. I do. I just have a couple of comments. I, um, there was a lot of misinformation out there about what these proposed changes were. And I just want to make it really clear that a lot of this is coming from the state dictating to cities because cities haven't been real good at um, incorporating different types of housing into existing residential neighborhoods. So again, a lot of these requirements came from House Bill 2001 and Senate Bill 458. 
and we are required to comply. So we had to adopt amendments and compliance with those for the middle housing as well as Senate Bill 458. And then at, we're doing a mass mailing coming up for another code amendment. And we did the same mass mailing last October. And um, between now and then, we have an additional 500 addresses that we need to mail to. So I know we are out there building, or not we, but um, developers are out there building. And with all the areas being annexed in and the master plans being developed, I would think that there is still quite a bit of um, your, what did you say, normal um, single family detached dwelling units, because there's still obviously a huge market for your typical single family detached dwelling unit. Yeah, great. Uh, okay, a couple more. Um, this one's from Anonymous. Are there are any of these codes coming out for Deschutes County outside of the city? I don't think that the counties were required to um, implement House Bill 2001. And if you weren't required to do House Bill 2001, then I don't think you're required to do Senate Bill 458. House Bill 2001 was geared towards cities. So again, if you're over 25,000 population, then you had a lot more requirements. And then if you were uh, between 10 and 25,000, um, you were only required to update your code for duplexes. You didn't have to so much address the triplexes and quads and cottage clusters like the city of Bend was required to do. But I don't think these were geared towards um, the county. Okay. Uh, John Gill asks, uh, will we get a copy of the slide deck? This is very informative and thank you. I'll email to um, you, Steve, and then you can uh, send it out. Yep, perfect, perfect. And uh, I've got Andy Phillips. What can an owner expect to pay for permits on building an ADU or duplex? Um, I think I have the uh, fees back here. Hold on one sec. Um, yeah, and as I said, that these fees are going to be. This is just for the um, for the SECs, which is the major fee that you have. You have a review. There's a there's a fee you pay for uh, reviewing the plans as well, but um, and these are going to be updated and they're going to go up, uh, I think, in July. Um, and you also you can get online to find these two on the city uh, the city website. Um, but yeah, so an accessory dwelling unit, um, the street, you know, it's about I think it ends up being about like eight or nine thousand um, dollars. Is what we've seen in this last development that we did, um, but yeah, I would encourage you just to uh, to get on the city website and then it'll it'll have the most updated stuff. And one thing I want to note too on the process: so for middle housing, if you did a duplex, triplex, um, townhome, any of those, we have to treat them just like single family detached dwellings now because of House Bill two thousand one. And what that means is instead of what we used to require is them going through a Type One minimum development standards review and then a building permit those processes have been consolidated. So now you basically apply for just a building permit, just like you would for a single family home. And during that building permit review is when we'll look at your setbacks and your height, your compliance with the development code, but it's all one process now. So it's much faster um, than it used to be. Okay, great. Okay, we got two more real quick. Is uh, Anna Ruder asks, is there a concern about a large snow load on the butterfly design where the snow would slide down into the middle of the roof and potentially build up in that area. Yeah, no, I think there is, but um, the way that it's uh, been designed and we obviously have an engineer that goes over our designs to make sure that that all works for our area, um, is it, it comes down to, the, it has a bit of a tilt that is in the center of it that then sends um, sends things down to the to the gutter that's there. Now some will build up and you'll have to get up on your, uh, on your house and, and shovel the snow off of there. Um, like you do when we get lots and lots of snow on most roofs, but um, it has gone through an architect and an engineer to make sure that the um, loads are, uh, uh, we have the, the required um, support for that. Awesome, thanks. Uh, Nancy Pop asks, what are the CCNRs like in these cluster developments? Um, it depends, you know, you know kind of dependent that first development that we did, there was an existing HOA. Um, so we were the declarant. So we were able to write our and amend our own CCNRs. 
Um, now that has that has now evolved because all of the the owners have, for instance, um, one example is there was month to month because that's what's allowed in the city. Um, uh, short term rentals aren't allowed in that code anyways, but there was month to month that was allowed in the cottage development um, and the HOA decided that they wanted it to be, I think, a minimum of six months or a year. So there wasn't as much turnover, um, but it's kind of up to the developer at first to write all those CCNRs and then it's up to the um, it's up to the community once they take it over. Um, to decide if they want to amend or change anything. And okay. I believe that the development code has requirements of what is required in those CCNRs. Um, I just can't remember off the top of the head, my head what those are. Okay, last one. Uh, Wendy Cooper asked, how does the city intend to deal with all of the cars now that less parking is required? Um, so as I've mentioned, you know, we have received a number of middle housing applications and um, most of them are still proposing parking requirements because they need to either be able to rent the units or sell the units. So, and many of them, like even Jesse's products still even have the garages included. Um, and then I suppose if there isn't any parking on site, then there's always available on street parking. Yeah, and I think, you know, that's definitely what we see. We, we almost always want to have at least one parking space. It'd be, it's difficult to sell a home if, it, if there's no parking at all. Now, the micro apartment is a different thing for us. Um, we only have uh, half, there's half the parking in the parking lot for the units. So we only have 20 um, actual car parking spaces. Uh, we have multiple uh, uh, electric bike um, uh, plug-in stations and we'll have bikes that are available for that, those residents and that apartment is on um, is on a transit line uh, so it's a bit of an experiment for us and this is part of kind of what this the the code uh, the code stuff that where they're they're allowing the developer to kind of decide um, you know what they want to develop and then let the market tell us if what we decided was right or not um, but I think there's there's definitely always this parking question and um, and what Pauline is saying is really important for everyone to remember as much as many times as we say it, um, and that's that it's not uh, it's not a requirement for us to have no parking. That's an option, and I think I think you'll see very few developers not have any parking for for development. But I think you will also see that there will be more more cars on the streets. Awesome. Well, we're up against the clock. Uh, Pauline and Jesse, thank you. That was phenomenal. It was really good info. Um, appreciate you uh, educating us and appreciate you doing that uh, for Deschutes County title. I um, want to thank all of you for attending. Um, we will get the slides uh, emailed to you, uh, certificates. We will get to you by next Tuesday. Um, reminder, the class has also been recorded on our website. Uh, it'll be up there shortly. So if you ever uh, want to get this information or watch this class again, um, you can get it there. And um, just on behalf of uh, Annette Zukaitis, Krista Carpenter, uh, I saw Evie Henderson on here. Uh, uh, from all of us at Deschutes County Title, appreciate you attending and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.